Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Michael Foe. I am a cardiologist in the clinical cardiology section here at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, I have a number of interests and one of my chief interests, both clinically and from a research point of view, has been the relationship between heart disease and obstructive sleep apnea. And I'm Dr. Rena Mera, uh, Director of Sleep Disorders Research in the Neurologic Institute and Professor of Medicine. Uh, also have a very strong interest in the relationships of sleep disordered breathing and sleep disorders in general uh, as it relates to cardiovascular disease um, with a focus on cardiac arrhythmias and atrial fibrillation. And over the last 15 years or so, uh, have been focused on research efforts to better understand those interrelationships. And Dr. Mir and I have known each other for quite a while, and we've collaborated on research projects and have shared patients mm -hmm. over the years. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think that our practices sort of complement one another pretty well. What a lot of patients and even practitioners don't realize is how common obstructive sleep apnea or sleep disorder breathing is in patients with any sort of cardiovascular disease. The two problems uh, are very intertwined at multiple levels. And so I think finding patients requires uh, a certain degree of curiosity and an awareness that even though they may not volunteer to you that they're having difficulties waking up in the middle of the night with difficulty breathing, or that their wife or husband no longer sleeps in the room with them because they snore too loudly, or they're having difficulties falling asleep or falling behind at work, uh, that they you know, have these complaints. In my practice, I've come to realize that sleep apnea is so common in patients with cardiovascular disease that it's become a part of my routine screening questionnaire for every patient that I see. So I ask them questions about sleepiness, about snoring, about um, morning headaches, everything that are sort of associated with obstructive sleep apnea. And also interviewing their bed partners in the office is a, an important step in that. And that's where you find these people. And they're not hard to find um, in the Heart and Vascular Institute. You just have to remember to look. Absolutely. And I think that it's, it's wonderful to have these collaborations across cardiology and sleep medicine to be able to care for our patients. Um, and as you said, Dr. Full, there's, you know, the standard symptoms that we oftentimes think about are snoring, tiredness, observed apneas, um, high blood pressure as far as risk factors, elevated body mass index um, greater than 35, age greater than 50, neck circumference that's enlarged in men greater than 17 inches in women greater than 16 inches and male gender. So, um, and those are all the components of a common screening instrument called the stop bang instrument that we oftentimes use. And if there's three or more of those factors that are positive, then folks are considered to be at high pretest probability for obstructive sleep apnea, but we recognize as well that there are limitations to how our standard screening approaches work in the cardiac population. So patients with underlying cardiovascular disease, we are recognizing have different symptom profiles and right. we may be, if anything, kind of scratching the surface and maybe even missing folks by using our standard approaches. And um, I think we need more research in that area to better understand, you know, who, what, what factors we should specifically be looking for in our screening process for those with underlying cardiac disease. Yeah, I agree. Uh, not everybody complains of profound symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea. I mean, you certainly do meet those people where they're day-to-day -day life is so adversely affected by their sleepiness that uh, when you finally get them diagnosed and get them treated, to, it can be sort of a life-changing event for them. Uh, but I also use the stop bang questionnaire in, in my office practice and I'll meet people who you know qualify for screening who may not tell me about a lot of excessive sleepiness, but they have a lot of underlying cardiovascular disease that I know personally is associated um, 
you know, with the presence of obstructive sleep apnea. And if they're not terribly symptomatic, these are the ones that require a little bit more coaching in terms of the importance of treatment. Uh, and, and I find that the, their cardiovascular disease can be a big motivator. You know, I have patients who complain constantly about having difficult to control high blood pressure and taking so many pills for their blood pressure. And, you know, those that end up with significant obstructive sleep apnea, I'll tell them that, you know, there's credible evidence that that sleep apnea is a potent driver of high blood pressure and treating it might make your blood pressure easier to control. And it's strongly associated with virtually any cardiovascular illness. Uh, but I think hypertension and, and rhythm disorders in particular, um, atrial fibrillation in, you know, specifically, uh, there's a very strong correlation. And so, you know, for the ones that aren't horribly sleepy, I still might convince them uh, to entertain the notion of treatment and diagnosis uh, just by virtue of potentially making their cardiovascular illnesses easier to treat. Absolutely. And I think that helps when we have that partnered approach because oftentimes if I tell a patient, oh, you know, this is the treatment plan, it's, it's sometimes more convincing when it comes from their cardiologist and they really um, make drive home that key point that it can the treatment of that sleep disorder or sleep disorder breathing really can help their cardiovascular outcomes as well. Yeah, certainly. So one question that I get in my office practice, you know, I, I, if I screen somebody and, and I do a home sleep apnea test or refer them to uh, an in-lab polysomnogram and they end up with the diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea, I get a lot of eye rolls and groaning when I bring up um, CPAP or positive pressure um, airway management. Um, and I think that part of it is that the patients don't fully understand that there's different modes, that there's different types of masks, and there's different treatment options. I was wondering um, if you could elaborate, even educate me on um, the sort of the breadth of things that one can offer to treat sleep apnea, um, aside from, you know, what they consider to be what they call the Darth Vader mask. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it, it is challenging. You know, the so obstructive sleep apnea, by sheer vir virtue of the pathophysiology involving upper airway collapse, uh, which can occur at different sites of the airway um, that is behind uh, the, the tongue, behind the palate, or below, um, is really amenable uh, you know, most amenable to positive airway pressure because positive airway pressure splints all aspects of the airway irrespective of where the collapse is occurring. And so that is why it is our go-to and typical first line treatment for uh, obstructive sleep apnea. There are other treatment options uh, to consider. Uh, upper airway surgery has been considered an option, such as uvula platophryngoplasty, where the soft palate and uvula are removed. Um, the outcomes with that are not very good. It's a coin flip, a 50-50 chance as to whether that's going to be effective in treating the obstructive sleep apnea. So that is oftentimes not a route we go, and sleep apnea tends to recruit us or recur over time, even if there happens to be some improvement with that um, intervention. Um, other options uh, that are being increasingly considered and used are uh, oral appliances. So if patients have milder or even maybe moderate degrees of obstructive sleep apnea, the oral appliance is an option as it uh, works by uh, advancing the mandible. So there's these, there's these mandibular advancement devices that need to be custom made. And, and that happens in partnership with an orthodontist or dentist that's trained to do so. And we happen to have some great colleagues here that we work with to do that. And, and now what we're finding also is this hypoglossal nerve stimulation, uh, which can be an option for those who have more severe degrees of obstructive sleep apnea. And so for those that are perhaps less obese, um, who have, again, more severe degree of obstructive sleep apnea, then this upper airway neurostimulation uh, device can actually be very um, effective in treating that sleep apnea. 
uh, recognizing there has to be certain anatomical characteristics that are conducive for that particular intervention. Um, and not, it, it may not be all those who have severe sleep apnea who are ideal candidates, but um, under the evaluation of an ear, nose, throat doc and sleep specialist, we can um, uh, basically do some testing to figure out what kind of collapse of the airway there is and what phenotype the patient has and whether they'll be amenable to the neurostimulation. That's great, that's a great review. I have a lot of patients that have read about the hypoglossal nerve stimulator and because it's kind of fancy and high tech, I think that, you know, there's a lot of interest in it. But as you say, um, you know, people who qualify for, for it or who might benefit from it, um, you know, there's a screening process that unfortunately yeah. limits a lot of people in terms of uh, who qualifies. And it's really interesting, you and I have published yeah. in this area, there's not a lot of data uh, in terms of the effect of hypoglossal nerve stimulation on cardiovascular outcomes such as blood pressure. Um, but we uh, did a study where we compared those who had positive airway pressure compared to hypoglossal nerve stimulation um, and simply looked at blood pressure um, as the outcome and found that interestingly, those who had positive airway pressure intervention were more likely have to have blood pressure reduction yeah. than those who have hypoglossal nerve stimulation. Um, whereas those who had hypoglossal nerve stimulation actually had a greater improvement in their degree of sleepiness compared to positive airway pressure. Um, and so I think we need more data in this space to help inform our decision making with patients. No, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. In summary, I think if you're a patient or a provider uh, caring for patients who have disorders like difficult to treat hypertension, um, atrial fibrillation, particularly if the onset of the atrial fibrillation is at a, a younger than typical age, or if it's a very difficult to manage uh, rhythm disorder, um, that these are the people that you should have a very high index of suspicion for obstructive sleep apnea. And if you're a patient, um, you know, you can inquire about being tested. Uh, and if you're a provider, I think, uh, you know, educating yourself about the stop bang questionnaire and administering the questionnaire, it literally takes a minute uh, of your time in, in a patient interview. And during that, a minute with a tape measure, because a lot of people don't often know their neck size. Uh, men tend to, I find, because guys buy shirts based on their neck collar size. Women sometimes you have to measure. But, um, you know, I think you can very quickly ascertain those that are at, at moderate or high risk for having sleep apnea and refer them for appropriate testing. And if you strongly suspect obstructive sleep apnea in a patient that doesn't have a whole lot of other medical problems or any kind of physical disabilities or limitations, uh, they can get a, a home sleep apnea test in a relatively timely fashion uh, that can give you um, uh, you know, something to go on that moves you in the right direction. Absolutely. So building on that, I, I, I agree. I think in patients who were highly suspecting obstructive sleep apnea, where there's high pretest probability using a screening instrument such as the stop bang, for instance, um, that's where home sleep apnea testing may be a reasonable option provided that there's not a lot of significant uh, cardiac disease, and that's a bit open to interpretation, but if there's severe heart failure, um, cardiac dysfunction, then perhaps um, an in-lab study may serve you better because you can then see if there's a central component to the sleep apnea and not obstructive only. Um, but if, say, there's cardiovascular risk, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, coronary disease, but otherwise um, not uh, you know, significant cardiac dysfunction, then uh, home sleep apnea testing is a very reasonable place to start. And we know if there's high pretest probability, despite the limitations of home sleep testing, we typically will um, pick up on that diagnosis of sleep apnea. But importantly, if you're suspecting that diagnosis of sleep apnea and you do the home sleep test and it is not indicative of sleep apnea, then 
I would still pursue in-lab testing um, because you're clinically suspecting that sleep apnea and the home test has limitations um, to the approach. So if you're clinically suspe suspecting, then uh, negative home study, I would proceed with an in-lab uh, study to really just ensure that there's absence of uh, sleep apnea. Any patient who has concerns about their heart disease and the presence or absence of underlying um, obstructive sleep apnea, um, I'd you know, be happy to see you. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm easy to find on the website. Yes, and it's wonderful to have colleagues like Dr. Full who are so engaged and uh, great partners in identifying sleep apnea and then facilitating and routing them to our sleep disorder center for further uh, diagnostics and treatment um, and so that we really make sure that we're providing the best care for our patient in optimizing the treatment of those underlying sleep disorders to then uh, mitigate and lessen any um, you know, uh, cardiovascular uh, issues that may arise or negative cardiovascular outcomes.